All right, so everybody, welcome Will back to the, well, I don't know, is it the first world country of Texas now, or is it second world? Where are you at right now? Oh, I think, I think we're in developing. Um, uh, there's still food shortages. It's maybe, like even getting fast food, it's maybe uh, 40 minutes or so wherever you go. It's, but it's, it's uh, a lot better. We've got power and water. Um, only thing that's left to recover is uh, food being reasonable. <laughs> Who would have known that you know in the um, the, the the lovely land of uh, Republican Texas, the Red Texas, that this could happen? If if you might be able to recap your past what two three weeks? Oh, uh, I guess yeah, past uh, yeah, past two weeks really. Yeah, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah I guess uh, woke up Sunday morning like two a.m. Power went out. Um, uh, Austin Energy, just our local energy utility, basically said, oh, we're on rotating outages, so expect to have power back in like 45 minutes as you rotate through circuits, and then like eight hours later, it was like very obviously a lie, <laughs> and they basically said, oh, if you don't have power, like, screw you, like, maybe you'll get it back in a few days, but... We got lucky because uh, we had a fireplace. So a lot of people did not get lucky. And uh, as you've probably seen on various news sources, uh, hundreds of people froze to death in their homes from this. Um, but we got, we got really lucky. We had friends nearby with power, so we were able to stay with them for a few days. Uh, we lost water, but really only for a couple days. And we were only after water came back, it was like two days and then it was drinkable again, but yeah. So Austin Energy is your provider, you said? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that seems to be, uh, actually yeah, that was the first match I came across. That's a city of Austin service, so it's a municipal power company? Uh, yes, uh, I don't, I, I do not fully know how they work, but it is, you're right, it's the, it's the city one, so like uh, the, uh, like I think it's the, the city council can change how it works, but yeah. And okay. It's, and it's that like we don't have to go with Austin Energy because of because of the way the Texas energy system works. There's several companies we could go with. Uh, Austin Energy is just sort of the the most reasonable, least risky one to go with. Mm, interesting. Least risky. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> which, which gets into a little bit of the conversation here. Um, a couple of companies came up. There was one called Gritty. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Yep. Yeah. Gritty is the one where, so with uh, since energy in Texas is all privatized and deregulated, <clears throat> um, it means that it's just sort of open season for companies to completely eliminate risk to themselves and uh, <clears throat> make lots of money. Gritty in particular is the one where essentially consumers pay relatively close to ener like the energy price at cost, which normally is good because it gives you lower prices than uh, a fixed rate like what we have with Austin Energy, but is problematic in cases like this where instead of it being like the normal, what I think it's like several cents per kilowatt hour ends up being like like many, many dollars per kilowatt hour, which adds up incredibly quickly. So if you, went, if you go with something like Gritty, then during situations like this when energy prices hit like $9,000 per megawatt hour, uh, you just get hammered and there's nothing you can do. Hmm. And so... ERCOT, which I think you said that you've got a, a presentation from them that came across? Oh, yeah. So ERCOT is the, uh, uh, it's the Energy Reliability Council of Texas. Uh, essentially, they're, it, it's, it's, it's very fuzzy what they do, but effectively, uh, they're the, um, uh, they're the compromise that was made when Texas wanted to deregulate and uh, make everything like privately 
owned and have a free market for energy prices. So ostensibly what ERCOT is supposed to do is to make sure that uh, the energy de grid doesn't go down, that everyone always has power, and then make sure that people are like trading energy fairly on the market. Um, however, because like, like it's, uh, like because they're effectively anti-regulation, that means that like they don't do a lot of things that you would think that a council with the name reliability in its name would actually do. So <clears throat> um, early, earlier this week, they announced that like half of their executive board resigned. And during this meeting, uh, like es essentially it was a two hour long, please don't sue us. Uh, meeting <laughs> uh, where they talked about the history and then they tried to wiggle their way out and say like, oh, it's not our fault that <clears throat> no one decided to weatherize their stuff. Um, uh, but it's very, it's very revealing the way that they've worded some of these things. So it's like uh, generation, so like power generation, owners and operators are not required to implement any minimum weatherization standard or perform an exhaustive review of cold weather vulnerability. No entity, including uh, PUC or ERCOT, PUC is uh, the Public Utility Commission, uh, has, so has rules to enforce compliance with weatherization plans or enforce minimum weatherization standards. So uh, that doesn't mean that they can't make rules. It simply means that they don't. Um, and then uh, in, in 2011, uh, like af after we had a winter storm in 2011 where uh, it didn't get as bad as this, but it was obvious that a disaster like what happened last week was very possible. The PUC basically said like, hey, you have to conduct flight visits and uh, like actually have weatherization plans, but the way ERCOT implemented that, it was essentially like all bark and no bite. There was uh, like people could essentially self-certify by filling out a form and there was no like, like th th there's, there's no real requirement or bad thing that happens if uh, like if you don't meet this, you simply have to fill it out. Sounds like a good old boy system to me. Yep. Um, the other, so the R in ERCOT stands for reliability? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Th that's, that's quite um, ironic. Um, so hopefully this new board, if they're not going to rely on reliability, and it's in their name and the, the acronym, they need, just need to rename the whole organization. Yeah, they can go with ECOT. So, so we'll see where that goes. So um, the other thing that happened in, in the Wall Street Journal, it seemed like they pulled all this data together quite quickly. This was on February 24th, and I sent you a link to this article, that since Texas decided to deregulate. Now, if we go back further, Republicans are all about deregulation. We can't have the government you know, in, in any business except when it comes to abortion. Yes. Then we've got to regulate everything around a vagina. But... Um, what everything else we can't regulate. So when Texas decided to deregulate electricity back to 1999, mm -hmm. um, that Texans paid a an extra $28 billion in electricity. Yep. Yeah, just uh, uh, one of the ways that they sold deregulating the energy market here was, oh, by deregulating, it'll reduce costs with the free market. It's a race to the the cheapest price possible. So <clears throat> like they sold it to the public as, oh, you'll have cheaper energy bills because energy plants won't be having to do all, like meet all these expensive regulations like weatherization. And uh, like as that article that you brought up pointed out, um, we actually pay more because like at the end of the day, like the companies may be saving money by not doing weatherization. They still want to make money. So, uh, like their profit has to come from somewhere and it comes out of everyone's pockets. 
Yeah, and let's go back and look at something here. Let's say that you chose to go with another provider like Gritty instead of Austin Energy. Gritty is not going to come out to your house and unplug Austin Energy and plug in Gritty. Nope. They're just simply going to do a switch somewhere in the software and say, stop billing Austin Energy and start billing Gritty to this particular address at 123 Main Street. Yep. Is all that happens. And I guess further along the line, there's something a little more complicated that the power starts, you know, getting, you know, uh, a little more, you know, gray area there. But there's literally not, it, it's not like ordering your, you know, cable from Comcast or your telephone from AT&T. Mm -hmm. It's the same line. And the equivalent, if anybody's listening here from Metro Atlanta, is you have the gas providers here in Metro Atlanta. A similar thing happened where the gas company, Atlanta Gas Light, who has a history back, I think back to the 60s and 70s, when Atlanta had a huge housing boom, Atlanta Gas Light got in with all of the uh, home builders and said, hey, we've got this thing called natural gas that we want to put in all the homes. And they became a, a monopoly on natural gas providers. And you know, it, not necessarily it was fully a bad thing because the other alternative is you've got to have trucks on the road that are bringing propane to the homes. And that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Because you've got to put gas in the trucks to get propane and, and then you're going from house to house. So, you know, in, in modern America, it probably makes sense if you're going to do gas, you need to put it in the ground and do pipes, right? But then you create a monopoly. So then Georgia decided and said, well, maybe we need to bust up, in air quotes, this monopoly called Atlanta Gas Light. And now you have, in, uh, in Metro Atlanta, they're called gas marketers, mm -hmm. is what they're called in Metro Atlanta. And they advertise all the time. You've got Scana, you've got Atlanta Gas, um, uh, all these different ones. And let's say you go with this one and you get Delta Sky Miles, if you go with this one. If you go with this other one, they'll give $100. But the other thing, and Gritty, I think, does this too, is you can lock your rate in. So they'll say that for the next six months, you get this so many cents per therm. And you get to pay that rate for the next six months instead of, quote, just letting it ride. I think Gritty allows you to do this. Is that right in Texas? Oh, I've not looked into uh, like that part of Gritty. I've only looked in the the surface level one where uh, you pay the, the current rate. Gotcha. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, some of like the non-Austin energies of Texas allow you to say, well, for the next six months or the next year, you know, I agree to pay X number of dollars per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. And that kind of locks you in. Well, who in their and you know would have the forethought or paying Miss Cleo or Crystal Ball to think that Texas is going to have a catastrophe like this. Yeah. Now the other thing I, I, I assume that happened in Texas is that Texas decided to not connect themselves to any other neighboring states for power. Is that true? Yep, that is correct. Uh, as part of deregulating Texas energy infrastructure, uh, we had to like essentially disconnect ourselves from uh like from the from the the national energy grids uh because otherwise we would have had to conform with the uh like federal regulations such as weatherization uh since we didn't want to do that then <clears throat> that meant that it was super annoying to actually like just like get power from other sources to us Heaven forbid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heaven forbid there's a catastrophe and uh, we don't have enough power. So l let me get this straight. Uh, Texas is fully, sus in air quotes, sustainable mm -hmm. on all of its electricity? Yeah, so, um, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, or, um, yeah, so the, it's most of Texas. There's, there's a few places like El Paso that uh, didn't end up being part of this this energy grid, but yeah, so Texas is its own, uh, so it's really difficult to get energy from other places if we don't have enough. Hmm. So that also mm -hmm. became a pretty big deal, because if, so you've got, what, natural gas producing energy there, are there coal? 
Yep. Yeah, it's uh, natural gas and coal are the the big ones. Uh, believe. Let's see, I'm trying. I'm trying to quick see if I've got a got the breakdown by fuel source. No, I, I don't have that handy. But no, no worries. Natural but gas and coal are the main ones. Of course, because you know the fossil fuels. Heaven forbid we have a nuclear plant in Texas, because you know. Mm -hmm. the, uh, that that could be a, a worse catastrophe than whatever. But what, oh, you know. we do actually have nuclear. Oh, mm -hmm. stop the presses! You know, <laughs> never never mind that going on out there. But um, but that you know reduced the ability for when some of these power producing mechanisms mm -hmm. came to a screeching halt because of the freezing cold. Yep. Suddenly, the Texas market for power went through the roof yep. and everyone that you know needed that power now what Austin Energy on their website they say that they kind of already locked the rate in so you as a customer of Austin Energy you're not going to see a big spike in your bill correct yeah it's it's just going to it's going to stay flat yeah but these other folks who had decided to you know kind of uh, gamble for lack of a better term with your power bill they're freaking out um there was a uh co-worker of uh mike's out in texas who was running around her house unplugging everything in her house mm -hmm. when she got power back because she didn't know how much her bill apparently there are apps from these companies mm -hmm. that they give you like a minute or hour by hour usage thing and they tell you how much power you are literally using by the minute or hour which just seems a bit maybe too real time, but I guess it's a good thing because some folks were saying that they're going to have like a sixteen thousand dollar bill coming up. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how that's resolved. Um, I'll see. I'll see if I can pull up the the statement that one of the companies made. Well, I think one you posted, they said that we'll work with you and we'll let you start paying your bill and in installments over the next 10 yeah. years. Yes. Um, uh, so, yeah, so the, the question they were asked is, uh, is, is CPS Energy, so they're one of the companies that sent out the $10,000 or more bills. Someone asked them, is, C is CPSC going to provide payment relief to customers? And their answer was, we understand it would be unacceptable to have customers bear the cost on their monthly bill. So we are working diligently to find ways to spread the cost to 10 years or longer to make it more affordable. So it's like, like it is, we are apparently like in a state where it is acceptable for someone to go into debt for a decade because they chose not to freeze to death. Like, well, you know, that sounds familiar because that usually is Republican health care. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's exactly. It's, you know, GoFundMe, um, you know, you just go into bankruptcy. Yeah, it's just uh, like you already have like for these people, they're already like like lower than average income. So of course they're going to go with option that seems cheaper, but opens them up to more risk. And then disaster strikes, and all of a sudden, like oh, they're I mean they've got a ten thousand dollar debt, and how the hell are they going to pay that? Like, and apparently in Texas, this is acceptable. So I did go to Gritty's website because I was reading through how this all works. Because we don't, like I said, we have the gas thing here in Metro Atlanta, but we don't have the power thing. Um, but they say that uh, at Gritty's website, um, it is this wholesale cost of electricity plus the TDU delivery charges, Yep. which I don't know how much that, that is, plus taxes and fees that we pass along to you without markup, for nine ninety nine per month, so Gritty makes nine ninety nine per month. But what are the TDU delivery charges? Oh, um, it's not uh like that much. Like it's, it's it's enough for them to make a healthy profit, but that's uh, but it's it's not like uh, it, it it's not significant compared to uh just the cost of the electricity. Gotcha. See, AGL in Metro Atlanta, there is an AGL pass through charge. Or customer service charge yep. that still gets added to your gas bill, so you're you're basically paying another middleman. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, to like, market gas to you or market electricity to you. Yeah, this is another place where your comparison to healthcare, like like really works because like 
we call them healthcare providers, but really they're just a middleman that negotiate prices. This is exactly what these Texas energy companies do. They, <clears throat> they're, they're essentially negotiators between power producers and you. They just buy power in bulk and then sell it to their customers. Uh, they don't really provide value. Uh, they just, uh, like, uh, it just you have to go through them if you want power because you're unlikely to be able to set up a deal with like an individual power plant. And the good old Wall Street Journal between 2004 and 2019 summed all that up to $28 billion yep. in Texas and extra. However, they said that folks in Texas that stayed on traditional utilities like mm -hmm. yeah, Austin Energy actually paid 8% less than the national average during that time frame. Yeah, though I would like, uh, yeah, I, I would argue that's not because Texas is doing things right. I would argue that that's because uh, we're not maintaining or upgrading our energy grid. <sighs> so, Lovely. Yeah, it, it is cheaper, but we pay in other ways, like not having power for a week. <laughs> and then, uh, so what happened at lunch today? What, what's the uh, food shortages? Oh, it's just, um, uh, it's uh, right now there's lines to get into grocery stores. Uh, so a lot of people are just saying like, screw it, just going to go get fast food instead rather than wait in line for an hour to get in, like, like in a grocery store just to come home and still have to make food. So everyone's like, okay, go get fast food and uh, you can wait in line for 40 minutes just to get lunch. It's, uh, it's still pretty crazy. What's going on in the grocery stores? That they don't have enough people there, or what's going on there? Oh, it's um. Uh, so because of COVID, only a certain number of people can be in the stores, mm. and then add on to that, they don't have enough for everything. So they need like police officers looking to make sure that people aren't just like buying all the eggs, or like all the milk or anything. So that just sort of slows, like it slows down your trips in the grocery store when you do go. And then uh, because only a certain number of people at a time can be in the store, you <clears throat> like in uh, during peak hours, you can end up with lines just to get in. <sighs> but, but that's Texas. So you can't mess with Texas. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Now, what happened with the water? So I assume when the power went out, there were then system degradations to get the water in the right place, right? Yep. Yeah, so uh, like because, so not only have we not really maintained our energy grid, we also have uh, like a water system that is not, it's, it's not robust to winter, and it's especially not robust to winter plus not having power. Um, a lot of times pipes in critical locations will have battery powered heaters, so even if they lose power for a few hours, they'll still be fine in freezing weather. <clears throat> But in this case, they were without power for days, so water mains froze. Uh, once electricity got turned back on and those pipe heaters got turned back on, uh, they unfroze, and uh, like it turned out that a lot of these mains had burst, so uh, like hundreds of thousands of people went without water. And then when they, even once they started fixing all of the mains, uh, it wasn't potable water because uh, one of the water treatment plants that ended up having to be, it ended up being shut down, I think, for power reasons. So uh, it was just a, a giant mess. But your senator, he came back from Mexico early yeah, okay. to start distributing water. Mm -hmm. yep. He got some photo ops. He was actually in his mask, his Texas mask, mm -hmm. Yep. Canadian Ted Cruz uh, was handing out water to folks. Um, any thoughts on the uh, the, the Canadian uh, senator out there? Oh, just what I find funny is the the Republican retort to like people pointing out that he went to Cancun in the middle. All all of this is the Republicans like saying, "Oh, what is a politician supposed to do? Are they just supposed to say like?" hey, like, I feel for you, and isn't this so bad? And then you have, like, on the other hand, you have uh, AOC raising literally millions of dollars to help 
Texans in need, like obviously AOC, like from New York helping us. And then you have Beto who didn't even win his election. He sets he set up a phone bank to call hundreds of thousands of Texans and they helped like dozens or hundreds of Texans who were stranded, needed food or water, who were elderly. Um, like that's what politicians are supposed to be doing, not just like abandoning the state and then when they realize that it's a PR nightmare coming back to hand out water, like there are there are things that politicians can do and the the Democrats here have really shown that like Republicans like Republicans simply do not care. And let's remember Ted Cruz barely won. I pulled the numbers. He he got fifty point eight percent of the vote. Was it? Uh, that sounds about right. Um, I don't know that he's going to be able to win the next time around. Is he up in two years? Um, uh, yes, two years. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, for Ted Cruz, uh, his approval rating was uh, uh, like it was. Like his net approval was zero percent, so approval and disapproval were equal before this event. There's a, there's something as a net approval rating. I didn't realize that. Oh so. yeah, uh, net <laughs> approval. So it's uh, I, I guess what's nice is it's it sort of tells you at a glance do more people like or dislike the person. So uh, for Ted Cruz, it was zero percent, which means an equal number of people liked and disliked him just before this disaster and. Uh, uh, we'll have to see how it how it changes after this event. Oh, um, yeah. So it, it was forty two percent favorable, forty two percent unfavorable. But uh, it'll it'll be a bit before we get those polling results. Yeah, and we see how well that worked here in Georgia for uh, Purdue and Loeffler. Uh Purdue said he was in. Now he's out. So I guess he did the numbers and figured that he can make more money trading stocks than actually running again. So he's out as of now. We'll see if he decides to uh, change his mind. And then Kelly Loeffler um, thinks it's a great idea to go out and create um, this organization called Greater Georgia that um, is basically the uh, allegedly the equivalent of Stacey Abrams' fair fight action. So allegedly, you're going to have Stacey Abrams and Kelly Loeffler with competing voters' rights organizations. Okay. Figure that one out. So if you go to greatergeorgia.com, uh, they're going to strengthen election transparency and uniformity. Now, if you can't say hypocrisy, because Republicans, they don't want any uniformity. They just want it to be chaos. But of course, you know, we got to push through all of these, um, you know, bills to change around uh, voters. So uh, one of the bills that's being introduced, uh, I think, is passed the Georgia Senate. That um, in Georgia, we, you you, uh, you don't have to have any reason to um, vote absentee. You can just request an absentee ballot. Well, the one of the bills up now is when you make the request to get your absentee ballot, mm -hmm. you have to put a copy of your driver's license in the envelope. And then when you get the ballot and fill in the ballot, you've got to put another copy of your driver's license and to send it back in. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, each of these things, like what's, like what's, I mean, sort of amusing is that they're choosing, they're choosing steps that sound relatively reasonable, but in reality, every step that you add decreases the number of people that are going to vote. Um, that means that like someone who doesn't want to take a lot of time to figure it out, like, okay, well, how much time does it take you to, like, print out a copy of your driver's license? Well, do you have a printer? Does that mean you have to go to to FedEx? Or what if you are someone who doesn't, like, have a driver's license? Um, like, you have some other form of identification. It just makes uh, each additional hurdle you add, there's someone where that's just going to be the last straw, and it is... Uh, it is a detriment to our democracy to have unnecessary steps like this, especially when, like, what was it, the the previous election in 2020 was the most, like, was it the NSA or someone that basically said it was the most secure election we've had so far? Mm-hmm. 
and Republicans lost, so now they're all freaking out because we, we, they can't have that. Yeah. And oh, by the way, Orlando is full of a bunch of deplorables right now. They're they're, they're wheeling some sort of um, fake gold statue of Trump and sandals through the place. <laughs> yeah. And they're worshiping it like it's some sort of um, the mythic god, or I, I don't know. The, the, these people literally, the, there needs to be a reprogramming camp somewhere. That they have, that they've just all gone off the deep end. Yeah. And and I, I, I literally, I, I think they have lost their way because Trump's not on Twitter, and they they have no guidance anymore. Yep. Because he, he he's he's how do, how do they know where to get their information? Um, because he's not on Twitter anymore. So he's going to speak on Sunday. I did an episode um, earlier this week mm -hmm. on um, I went through the CPAC uh, uh, agenda mm -hmm. and um, commented on a couple of the speakers. Um, but Sunday is going to be the grand finale when they you know wheel him out there and. Of course, he's going to be in rare form. He's been huddled up in Mar-a-Lago since he left D.C. Yep. and um, not on Twitter. And apparently he's been passing notes to other people, encouraging them to tweet for him. Um, you know, he's going to be in rare form. Mm -hmm. that, that's all what they paid for. That's, that's what they wanted to see. Yep. But I hope um, hope they they put a little bubble around Disney and protect it because they they don't they don't well they don't like Disney anyway so maybe they'll just ignore yeah. that. So. Oh right, with the 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 actress they fired. So uh, yeah, that, that, that old cancel culture. So. <laughs> yes. <sighs> who who would have thought we wouldn't have anything to talk about with uh, with with them out of office? But they they never um, never underestimate. What other topics should we cover this week? Um, yeah, that's 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 just what's been at the forefront of my mind. Uh, just uh, yeah, I, I did a lot of digging to see how reasonable it is to go solar in Texas, and it was uh, it was kind of revealing that there's a lot of like like uh, I guess uh, yeah. So just a little bit about what's like the benefit to the energy grid as a whole of people going solar, like putting solar panels on their home and everything is that in times of crisis like these where you do have the energy grid go down, if, uh, if people have solar power then, uh, like and battery backups, they can power like their own homes. But what's also nice is uh, if you can get pieces of the energy grid, or the more people that go solar on an individual part of the energy grid, uh, the less load it takes to power it because you don't need as much natural gas or whatever powering it because uh, people have solar and they have battery backups that are able to compensate like for like the load that there would be so um, uh, what that what that would mean is that like our energy grid would be more robust so the natural gas plants going down wouldn't mean that so many circuits would have to be taken on offline because it would be easier to support and turn in individual ones on and off. But I was kind of disappointed to find that, like, uh, there's a lot of really nice benefits that other states give to people that go solar that uh, are just really hard to find in Texas. Uh, one of the better ones is where you can actually sell excess energy back to the energy company. Uh, not only can you not do that in Austin, but it's actually illegal for you to? So. Yes, this came up on a work conference call. So there's a morning conference call every day that's global. We have folks in Ireland, folks in the U.S., and folks in the Philippines. And the guy in Ireland was talking about the solar panels on his house. And he's able to push, you know, I guess, energy back up to the grid. But then somebody else here in the States... Um, said that he was able to, but it um, it got worse. Like originally when he put the panels on, like he got full benefit from pushing power back to the grid, but now he only gets a 10% benefit. Mm -hmm. And then you say in Texas it's just completely illegal? Oh, no, uh, Austin specifically. There's certainly oh, Austin specifically. Yeah, um, uh, it's part of the Austin energy monopoly is that 
so Austin, Austin Energy, uh, they give you like an account credit, but of course if you're producing more energy than you're consuming, you will never use this account credit. You'll just accrue thousands of dollars in like account credit that you lose when you move away because you can't cash it out. And then uh, any companies that do offer that kind of deal are forbidden from entering into such agreements with Austin residents. <laughs> Uh, that that almost sounds like um, organized crime. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty <laughs> nasty, and it's like that's that's one of the biggest incentives, and ostensibly people that care about the robustness of the energy grid would want something like this. But at the end of the day, when you have someone where it's like, oh, they get more money when people aren't self-sufficient in producing power. They get more money when the energy grid is not robust. So they're going to fight against that. So yeah, we, we we just need to rename Ericot to uh, without the word reliability. Yes, yeah, that's everything. But mm -hmm. <sighs> the other thing that I I actually forgot over the past couple episodes was to try to find um, progressive uh, Democratic candidates mm -hmm. that have already announced that they are running uh, to talk about them because we, we do bitch about our Republicans but uh, was trying to find you know a candidate so I do have three so there is uh, Charlie Bailey here in Georgia that is running for Attorney General uh, he I believe this is his second time mm -hmm. um, uh, to talk about his um, the, the other guys, so uh, Carr is the uh, Attorney General in Georgia. He got caught up in a little scandal after Insurrection Day up in D.C. There was a Republican Attorney General Political Action Committee that um, Carr got caught being the chair of. Um, and then he claimed he didn't know anything about it because that's what every Republican yeah. does. Um, so when all that came out, uh, Charlie Bailey put his hat back in the ring and he's going to run for Attorney General here in Georgia again, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens there, so check him out. Um, my congressman, Barry Loudermilk, is uh, doing his typical thing and not doing town halls as usual, but a, a nice lady, Heather Kilpatrick, she has responded to a couple of my tweets, and she says she does want to do an um, episode, um, mm -hmm. but uh, Heather Kilpatrick has put her hat in the ring running against uh, Barry Loudermilk here in Georgia's District 11, who is right next door to Marjorie Taylor Greene, mm -hmm. who is working the media up and down this week yep. with her insaneness, but there is a lady, Holly McCormick, who is uh, putting her hat in the ring for Georgia's 14th district, that is uh, northwest Georgia. I honestly think that Heather Kilpatrick has a better chance of beating Barry Loudermilk. Um, if you look at the numbers, my district is slightly more blue in 11 than what uh, Heather Holly McCormick is going to see in 14 uh, with that district. But regardless, they are putting their hats in the ring, and we wish them all the best, and we welcome them to uh, join us on an episode uh, at any time. And anybody from Texas that is uh, going to run against Ted Cruz specifically. <laughs> now, they're in Austin. That's pretty blue, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, Austin is the, like, I guess the black sheep of Texas. Uh, the, I guess the, the Texas government likes to say that it's pro-small government, but whatever Austin does, the Texas government feels it has to find a way to, uh, <laughs> to neuter. Sounds just like Metro Atlanta, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you've got, um, if you look at Texas, you've got Houston, you've got Austin, San Antonio, yeah. Dallas. Are there any other blue pockets? Uh, those are, yeah, those are, those are the big ones. Um, yeah, there, there, might, there might be there might be other smaller ones, but those are the big ones. Um, uh, Fort Worth, of course, Paul being a city is very re is very red compared to the rest. Yeah, yeah, you got more blue pockets than uh, than Georgia. I mean, we got a couple of smaller ones, but it's uh, much bigger out there. So. All right. Oh, well, I have to actually quote. So I'm looking at, a, this was an hour ago, Charlie Bailey uh, here in Georgia. He puts his uh, picture of his dog. His um, hazelnut Percheka Bailey 
That's his uh, campaign dog here. Just woke up from a snooze and remembered I needed to finish this email before my dad, Charlie, will say the D word. No, not Democrat or donate or even discovery or dissent. Those are fancy lawyer words he uses. And no, not even dogs, as even go dogs, unless mom is asking, then go jackets, as in Georgia Tech. I'm talking about the best part of the day, dinner. So, yeah, so that's... Uh, cute little email from uh, Charlie that mm -hmm. get on his mailing list. So, wish him all the best. Anything else before we wrap this one up? Uh, nope. That's uh, it's everything I've got. All right. That may actually make uh, little hazelnut the uh, the picture for the episode this week. <laughs> so, all right. We'll uh, we'll talk to you later. Have a good weekend. Yep. You too. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Goddamn Liberals. We welcome your feedback. Please comment on this episode below or send us an email at feedback at gdliberals.com.